century, a parcel was rushed to London from the other side of the world. It was delivered to the British Museum of Natural History and was addressed to the man who later went on to become its director, Sir Richard Owen. His parcel contained a single bone. But it was enough for Owen, an eminent paleontologist, to deduce that it belonged to a giant bird. And that's how the world first came to know of its biggest bird, the moa from New Zealand. Thank you. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> that's great, as I thought. This is my invitation to New Zealand. What a great way to start my journey through Moa's Ark, by being greeted by the Maori, the first people of New Zealand. This ceremony is to welcome me onto their marae at Otaka in the southern part of New Zealand. Hey, Maliola. I greet and pay my respects to your meeting house, to your ancestors, and to you. I have made a journey, and your ancestors made a journey to this place. And they came, and it was an ark. It was an ark full of the most amazing creatures which occurred nowhere else on this earth of plants and animals. And since your people came and since my people have joined them on these islands, we all know there has been immense destruction. But these islands now, of all islands of the world, are beginning to show the way of how we can conserve the future. So I have come across this world and I have come to learn. But before I can start exploring just how Moa's Ark was formed, it's time for one last ritual, the Hongi. The pressing of noses and mixing of our breaths means that I am cleansed. Finally, I gain the blessing of the tribal elders. And now I'm ready to come face to face with the most distinguished elder of them all. Good day, old beakhead. The Tuatar. And of all the inhabitants of Moa's Ark, this was the one I most wanted to meet face to face. What are the secrets inside that head that allowed it to survive since long before the dinosaurs lived on this earth? 
The tuatara belongs to a group of reptiles called the rhynchocephalia, which means beakhead. And with a nose like mine, I think we've got a lot in common. Most of the beakheads, like the dinosaurs, disappeared millions of years ago, but not the tuatara. It's a living fossil that's been on board Moa's Ark since its formation and will have witnessed every stage of its epic voyage. Now, wouldn't it be marvellous if we could look at the past through the Tuatara's eye? For then we could perhaps understand how the Ark was made and how it fared on its long, long voyage. Old Beakhead must have found the Ark well stocked with many things to eat, including other living fossils, like Peripetus, seemingly half worm, half insect. And ancient frogs, considered the most primitive and perhaps the most delicious in the world. and giant snails, which themselves hunted giant earthworms on the forest floor. One thing the Tuatara never ate or was eaten by were warm-blooded carnivorous mammals. They arrived on the scene after the Ark had set sail. So the forests of Moa's Ark were a much safer place for creatures great and small, and these included strange birds which survived nowhere else on Earth, and many found they had no need to fly, like the kakapo and the kiwi, and even some insects put away their wings and became as large as mice. No wonder we call it an ark, and the mower ruled the roost. During her 80 million year voyage, the Ark and its ancient mariners have been through several cycles of climatic change. These have crowded its decks with tropical reefs and palms, its superstructure with the magnificence of temperate rainforest, and its mast with the glaciers of ice ages. Each has left its mark on the landscape and changed the makeup of the crew. The Ark has been refitted many times en route. Its massive plates welded and shaped by volcanoes spewing out new rock. The decks have pitched and tossed on the waves of mighty earthquakes. Its hulk has been worn down by erosion into a mere flotilla of low-lying islands almost disappearing below the sea. Then, new mountain chains rose up to pierce the cloud, challenging the erosive power of snow and ice. Now, if the idea of mountain chains going up and down like elevators seems like a fairy story, well, let me show you. Imagine my meat pies the world. Nice, cool crust on the top, and underneath, molten rock. Good stuff, this molten rock. But to complete the illusion, I'll add some real red magma. On goes the molten magma. <laughs> and back goes the crust of the Earth. Now, in actual fact, the Earth's crust is made up of gigantic pieces called tectonic plates. So a bit of planetary surgery. <laughs> right. Now, the continental plates actually float about on the molten magma pushed by enormous forces. And when one continental plate bashes into another, the whole thing starts rucking up to form mountain chains like the Andes, the Himalayas, and the Southern Alps here in New Zealand. Now, in other cases, and this is a real fascinating thing, one of the plates will go underneath the other and push it up, and out come bubbling all the... There it is! The molten rock comes bubbling to the surface. A line of new volcanoes. <laughs> Thirsty work, this plate tectonic. 
but that's why New Zealand not only has great meat pies, but also fabulous volcanoes. Auckland is New Zealand's largest city, yet flying over it you'll see plenty of volcanoes. Yes, Auckland is built on a field of almost 50 volcanoes. They certainly provide firm foundations, for the face of some are tattooed with the ancient marks of Maori gardens and settlements. Extinct these cones may be, but the field is very much alive, for the most recent volcanic display took place only a few hundred years ago on an island called Rangitoto out in the bay. The fire fountain magma flowed down the sides of the recently cooled lava. light rock called basalt, just like we catch up, was very squeezable. It oozed down to the sea, causing it to boil and steam. At least 300 years later, Rangitoto remains an inhospitable place on which life is still finding a tenuous foothold. The pioneers are Lycan and Pahutakawa. The seeds of the tree are able to germinate in damp crevices down in the rock. This year's flowers on the mature tree are not quite set, and that's because it's not quite Christmas. You see, the Pahutakawa is also known as the New Zealand Christmas tree. You know, I can't get used to the idea of celebrating Christmas in the middle of the summer. Well, I tell you, out there on the open lava, it's hot, real hot. Oh. So you see, once the Pahutikawa had made itself at home, lots of other sorts of plants nipped in all to take advantage of the shelter, just like me. What have we got? The fabulous kidney fern. No prizes for guessing how it got its name, but perhaps a prize for guessing how it got here. The little brown tips are sporangia bursting with spores, each one light enough to be blown about on the wind, which is how they reach Rangitoto in the first place. Wherever the Pahutakawa tree has unfurled its leafy sunshade, the decks of this, the newest bit of Moa's Ark, are filled with all sorts of other passengers. All have moved in since the eruption. Some came by wind, some by sea, and some with the birds. And amongst them is one of the most special plants on Earth, Xylotum. It may not win too many prizes in a beauty contest, but in there is the stuff all trees are made of, prototype wood. Because we reckon that the first plants ever to raise themselves up off the ground all around 350 million years ago look not unlike that. Silotum and its island home go together in a partnership echoed many times on Moa's Ark. Ancient plants and animals living on fresh new landscapes. And Honkitoto's profile in Auckland Harbour is a constant reminder that just below the surface, the magma is waiting to perform its job of creative destruction. Who knows when the next eruption will take place around Auckland? But every day, somewhere around Moa's Ark, volcanoes are busy doing their fiery work. Mostly they're underwater, unknown and unseen. Little vents building huge seamounts, slowly creating new islands. 
sitting next to the east coast of the North Island is one of Mowers Art's busiest landscape factories. White Island regularly pushes steam, ash and molten rock up from the womb of the earth. White Island is no isolated hotspot, but part of the so-called line of fire. This is a chain of active volcanoes that has formed along the line where one piece of the Earth's crust meets another. Remember my tectonic pie. And the best way to see these volcanoes is from a distance, from the open cockpit of a tiger moth. The line of fire extends into the very heart of North Island and has been reshaping the arc for millions of years. The fresh scars of Mount Tarawira and a string of blue crater lakes are testimony to the violence of past eruptions. All these awesome and immensely beautiful features draw tourists in their tens of thousands and nowhere is more popular than Rotorua, where eruptions are still happening, but on a slightly smaller scale. People come from all over the world to see, hear and smell the geothermal wonders of Rotorua. It's a tourist hotspot in every sense. Now the first people to put this geothermal heat to good use were the Maoris. They used it for cooking and for bathing. Then along came the Europeans and developed it into a spa. Now they reckon that the water contains all sorts of minerals which cure all sorts of ailments. And I must say the heat doing my back an awful lot of good. And it's even hotter outside. Well, 44 degrees may be too hot for my feet, but out in the natural spring, certain forms of life thrive in much hotter conditions, and one of them is a moss. Campylopus halomitrium, and it's a new plant for me, so I'm going to tick it off in my book. And it's a very special plant because it can grow in soil which is almost up to 70 degrees, just below the surface, and forms a nice thermal blanket giving protection. And so in this blanket, other plants, even flowering plants, can find a place to root. Paddling in the shallows on the edge of the moss mat are maggots feeding in the rich algal beds. And even flies make use of the thermal bathing facilities. Closer to the bubbling springs, only the algae can survive. And as there's nothing to eat them, they can photosynthesize to their heart's content, producing lots of little bubbles of oxygen. Closer to the boiling vents, the only bathers are the golden oldies, sulfur bacteria related to the first forms of life on Earth. They form a death-defying ring around water, which is too hot for any form of life. Even here, the rocks are covered with silica. Silica shape precipitated from the mineral-rich water bubbling up from deep underground. Indeed, it was the shapes of Sinta on a massive scale, the pink and white terraces said to be the eighth wonder of the world that first brought tourists here. The first time I heard about the pink and the white terraces was seeing pictures like this. And I had an uncle, he desperately wanted to come to New Zealand to see them. And though I told him they disappeared, he said, no, no, how can something as big as that be destroyed by just a volcanic eruption? Well, he hadn't seen a volcano, had he? And the tourists can't see the pink and white terraces anymore. 
their shattered remains lie beneath the placid waters of Lake Rotomahana. Around its shores, the bubbling water still creates thermal environments in which a number of tropical plants are found, plants that grow nowhere else in New Zealand. And here, another fern of the tropics, Nephrolepis, growing in its own geothermally heated niche in the rocks. And its life really does hang in the balance. If, you know, whoosh, out come to hot water, it will die. And of course, if the thermal activity goes away and it gets too cold, it can't grow here. But no matter. It's already prepared itself with millions of spores, and in the event of any catastrophe, they can blow away and find another greenhouse spot in which to grow. And there's always been plenty of hot spots around here. I'm standing on the site of what was the biggest geyser in the whole world. It spouted black water all 500 metres, that's 1,500 feet straight up into the sky. It only worked for a few years, and now perhaps all that pent-up energy is sleeping beneath my feet. But for how long? Because in thermal areas, things are always on the change. And the same is true wherever we travel in this part of Moa's Ark. This is Lake Taupo in the centre of North Ireland and near the end of the line of fire. It's a popular spot for boating and its trout fishery is world famous. But I wonder how many of the fishermen realise that they're sailing on top of the remains of one of the world's most destructive volcanoes. But then neither do the fish, or they don't appear to when you go down and take a look. These are resting on the exact spot where in 186 AD, one of the largest explosions on Earth took place. sent up a column of pumice more than 50 kilometres into the atmosphere. Fact, not fiction, because historians as far away as China and Rome noted the darkened skies for months afterwards. And if you don't believe them, well, in more recent times, the world saw the awesome power of a volcano when Mount St Helens exploded. The Taupo eruption was at least 30 times bigger. Well, there may well have been clever people in Rome and China to record the Taupo eruption, but of course, back in those times, there was no one living here in New Zealand to do the same thing. But that's not mine. There were the trees. Now, imagine I'm a male rimu growing in Puriora Forest 1,800 years ago, next to me lady friend. Beautiful, isn't she? Now, it's a super place to live, but we were a bit worried because generation after generation of trees had lived here, and this soil was somewhat impoverished. It could do, you know, a, a touch of fertiliser, a bit of top dressing. It was autumn, and she was full of the fruits of our labours, and we were looking forward to the next spring. When one day, looking out over the water tower, where we saw an immense column of fire and rock shoot up into the air to a stupendous height, and there it fell back to earth. It spread out, a blanket, rolling over the hills and destroying everything in its path, setting the forest on fire. All we could do was close down our breathing pores and hold tight. Tihoi Mauriora, I sneezed his life. And that's exactly what Torpo had done, sneezed a great blast of pumice across this landscape. And if you don't believe me, well, my feet and the trunk of me lady friend there point directly towards the centre of that explosion. And oh yes, it may have destroyed a lot, but it was like the biggest dollar of top dressing the landscape ever known. Pumice, new rock to form new soils to allow new forest to grow. And that's the true magic of the saga of Moa's Ark. Landscapes which continually renew themselves. The southern end of the line of fire is marked not by a full stop, but by the active volcanoes within the Tongariro National Park. 
Volcanoes are not the only active principle in the refitting of the Ark, as the coastal city of Napier knows only too well. Earthquakes take their toll. One of the most famous took place two years before I was born. Although the shape killed more than 250 people, from out of the destruction, new land rose from the bay, and the world got a new Art Deco city into the bargain. Noah's Ark is riding on the crest of a collision between bits of the Earth's crust. To the north, the Pacific Plate is sliding under its neighbour and has formed the line of fire. But to the south, the same Pacific Plate is actually sliding over the other continent's plate. Now that means that the middle of Moa's Ark is caught between the jaws of two enormous tectonic vices twisting in opposite directions. When the continental plates move, the decks of Moa's Ark are twisted and buckled and torn along huge fractures called fault lines. And Wellington, the capital city, sits astride a real whopper. And like Napier, some of the city's highest priced real estate was below low tide mark little more than 100 years ago. An earthquake lifted the shorefront to give Wellington new flat land, on which it has now built its railway yards, motorways and docks. Docks from which ships set sail to all the other parts of the world. Other parts of the world from which 80 million years ago, Moa's Ark herself set sail. Whole islands floating about the oceans may seem a little far-fetched, but the proof comes from the passengers, and this is one of the most important passengers. Not only make a great bookmark, but it gives us all the proof we need, because it's found on most of the major land masses of the Southern Hemisphere. Now, how did it get there? Well, plants travel about the world by means of their seeds, and I've got some of the seeds down there in the crack of the book. And the seeds of the southern beets, they're too heavy to be blown on the wind. They don't taste nice, so birds don't carry them about. And if they fall in the sea, they're killed off stone dead by the salt water. So how is it that the southern beach has got to Moa's Ark, which is 3,000 kilometres from the nearest land mass? Well, if you come up on the bridge, I'll show you. Every ocean grain vessel has its radar. The electronic eyes scanning the horizon, showing what's up ahead. Imagine this one could show us what happened in the distant past. Our radar of the past shows the southern hemisphere as it looked a couple of hundred million years ago. All the major land masses are joined together to form a supercontinent called Gondwana. Along one shoreline grew the ancestors of New Zealand's beech trees. But then, over millions of years, Gondwana began to break up. Africa, South America and India all set sail on the moving Earth's crust. And New Zealand, a little piece of land between Antarctica and Australia, began its lonely voyage into the Pacific Ocean. And that's why Moa's Ark has its southern beach, its Tuatara and many other unique plants and animals. Our voyage of discovery continued on the South Island, and I take up the story starting on another sort of beach. I've entered the annual Coast to Coast race. In less than two days, believe it or not, all these lot are going to race between one coast of New Zealand and the other. The event attracts athletic lunatics from all over the world, and they don't come much crazier than the organiser, Robin Judkins. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
number 213 ready for the start. And what better way of seeing the most rapidly changing part of Mowers Art than by running, cycling and canoeing? How did I let myself in this? across the Southern Alps? Still, I'll have the honour of being the first English botanist ever to make the crossing. And look at the competition, I might even win. to me, please. And that includes the English botanist talking to himself. Competitors, I want you to line up numerically and then back, back towards the sea, get one foot into the sea, and when the gun goes off, I want you to have a good trip, have a good trip from coast to coast. After the short run up from the beach, the route for the first day is going to take us by bicycle 60 kilometres up the Terramacau Valley and on toward the National Park. And that's where the real work begins, with a mountain run over the Alps through Goat Pass. The only good things are that I'm a Capricorn and will have a tailwind, because you see New Zealand lies in a belt of westerlies. Westerly winds mean lots of rain, cos in their journey over the Southern Ocean, the air picks up evaporated water, and as the clouds cross the mountains of South Island, the air rises and cools, and that's when it starts raining. Well, at least that's what the textbook says. Well, I may not be the fastest, but I'm the best prepared. They've got water bottles, but mine fill up as we go along. With my ingenious tunnel system here, I'm going to tap into the 12 metres of the rain that falls here about every year. That's almost 40 feet, and up to I'm up to the top of a five-storey building. Oh, you really do need an ark to live out here, you know. Wait for me! All that rain has meant that agriculture has never figured too highly in the economy of the West Coast. But there's one plant that grows very well here, and that's sphagnum moss. Collected from the forest, it's dried, sorted, and then bagged and exported for use as a medium for orchid growing. Sphagnum's value comes in its water retention capacity. It's literally an organic sponge with tiny holes in its cell walls capable of sucking up to 25 times its own weight in water. It's just what the West Coast needs to soak up all that rain. And it's a sustainable product of the forest if only it's collected with extreme care. The trees in this forest are podocarps, and they've been part of the crew of Moa's Ark since before the dinosaurs lost their race on Earth. Oh, I don't care if the others are giving away. This is far too nice a place to rush through. Uh, David, could you get a regal on, please? You're a disgrace to your profession and the English nation. And you're lost, David, you're lost. Am I? Am I? It's such a beautiful place. There's so much to see. So here it goes. Unfortunately, that's not me, but the path of the Alpine Fall, which is going to make the going much tougher from here on. I wish I'd never eaten that meat pie. As the fault has shattered the landscape, the Southern Alps have grown and grown and grown. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Just look at that blooming mountain up there. It gets higher every time I look at it. And of course, it really does. Parts of the Southern Alps are being pushed up at almost 20 millimetres a year. Now, as I'm the last, that means I'm going to have to climb higher than the rest. It's not fair. I'm going to put in a complaint. But of course, they won't believe me. They'll say that all that rain is eroding them back down again. The court. They're right. <laughs> Imagine some people do this for fun. But look at that lot almost the size of a house. And it's been tipped off as the mountains have been lifted up and did this roll down the river by the water. Fantastic place. <sighs> 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 Well, some of the others may have finished already, but at least once I get to the top, it's downhill all the way. Uh, halfway! Halfway, go! Oh, go. <laughs> go, he says. I don't know, I'm last. Long way to go and nothing to lose. Still, the alpine plant up here has got an amazing story to tell, so I think I'm going to enjoy them. Well, it was worth it. The biggest buttercup in the world. And of course, I was brought up on New Zealand butter, but, but how can a thumping great plant like that live on top of a mountain? Well, it is pretty sheltered down here amongst all the shrubs and things and of course down the bottom of the stem is a wacky great tap root down there underneath the ground storing the food for the winter the story that all these alpine plants have to tell is one of survival for unlike the mountain parrots they can't move down when the winter comes parrot up a mountain well when you're on mowers aren't you come to take unusual things completely in your stride You see, as new species arrive during the voyage of the ark, they've spread out to take advantage of everything that's on offer. Many things met the challenge of these young mountains, like the daisies. Recent arrivals, but now with more than 150 species found from the coast to the top of the crows, oh, I mean the pallet's nest. They're much better suited to the high life than I am. They know how to wrap up warmly against the months of snow and ice. All their leaves have fur coats, and many cuddle up tightly to form nice, cosy cushions. These plants that grow up here can withstand anything nature slings their way, except two things, these human feet. That's why ball walks like this are becoming very common in wild places around the world. The wooden slats are the friends of the plant. Only today they stood up to 200 pairs of fast feet and one pair of old plodders. Here he comes, David! Where have you been? Am I really there? <laughs> well done, mate. We've been waiting for you. What was it like? Well, I tell you something. I found out why plants stand still. They're not as stupid as human beings. <laughs> they just hang around and look beautiful. <laughs> well, off to bed, mate. Well done.
For the first line, move out, please, onto the road. First line. Come on, guys. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Oh, no. Here we go again. And you know, the second day is even longer than the first. Our route follows the Waimakariri River from the mountains to the sea, and we'll spend some of the day kayaking along it. Then it's on to the bikes again, across the Canterbury Plains and into Christchurch City, and the finish! As it's all downhill, I think I can afford to make a detour to take a look at some very special plants up on the aptly named Mount Baldy. The race goes on below a load of blooming masochists, but this was just too good for a botanist to miss. A mountain that's falling apart and all this moving scree, smashed up lot, is home to plants which grow nowhere else on earth. And this is one of them, a buttercup with the strange name of Ranunculus hastii. <laughs> Although it's one of the flashiest of the scree plants, you see, all those plants have to put up with the same problem of living in this mobile, smashed up rock. And they all have certain characteristics in common. Like, take a look at the leaves. They're fleshy and waxy, and often they have this purplish colour blending in with the rock. But also that purple colour helps protect them from the enormous amount of sunlight they get up here on the open mountain. The pigment protects them like a barrier creep. They're like a secret society of plants. The Apre Scree set. Many different families wearing similar colours and costumes that let them survive way up here. It looked a pretty impossible place to live with all these wacky like, dry rocks, you see, but we're high up, and in the winter, it is covered with snow and frozen, and as it freezes and pours, and the whole thing slips downhill, it sorts it out, you see, and all the fine stuff goes down underneath. And there you are, it's getting wetter and wetter as we go down deeper, and plenty of root space for these wacky, great, fleshy underground roots. And they spread right uphill. In fact, the whole thing is gradually moving downhill with the scree. That's why it's called hastii, because it's hastening its way down at the bottom. Of course, it really got his name from an explorer of the region called Harst. He was one of the first scientists to describe this scree landscape, a product of the steep slopes of these upwardly mobile mountains and a special rock called grey wacky. It really should be called grey cracky because it's brittle and easily shattered by the frost. And it's no wonder that these plants have to hang on tight because all this loose rock is heading down the slope and into the Waimakariri River. And that's where I must go. The Waimakariri is a broad, braided river, a wonderful meandering watercourse, one of several for which New Zealand is world famed. They have their own specialised and now very rare plants and animals. One of the most specialised of all is the rye-bill, the only bird in the world with its bill bent to one side. You know, I reckon the rye-bills have got a nose rather like mine. <laughs> I got mine in a rugby accident, but theirs is there for a special purpose. See, the stones in the river all rolled along and turned into nice round pebbles. And it's under them that the rye bill finds its teeth. So it's probably able to poke that bill right underneath. That's where all the juicy freshwater insects shelter out of the sun. So the rye bill is perfectly suited to life on the grey, wacky gravel. But that was until people arrived on the scene bringing their plants behind them. Now, some thought that riverbeds like this needed a bit of beautifying, so they spread lupin seeds about. The result, though pretty for the visitors, is a real bind for the rye builder and the other locals. 
where is that main channel? Oh, it's over there. Pack it in, mate. Pack it in. Now, you really are getting at me. But I don't actually blame you. You know, your lovely riverbank is covered with English plants. Come have a look. Look at that. Now, that, that, that's a gorse plant and back up there are looping. And they're beginning to take over this wonderful riverbed. You know, your way to go to the most marvellous place on earth. And you look at all the native plants. That is destroying it. Get, me, get your head down and look at these. They're your wonderful cushion plants, Ray Olius, but it's a daisy. Look, it's in full flower. It's a daisy. It's a daisy. Yeah, yeah, a daisy. David, <laughs> I've got a race to run. I'm going to leave you now, and I suggest that you get in a boat and you head on downriver, and that's it for the kayaking for you, mate. After that, you're into the cycling. <laughs> Well, some may call it cheating, but it's really called jet boating, another speciality of these rivers. And to tell you the truth, I didn't fancy my chances of kayaking through here anyway, as this is where the Waimakariri squeezes through a narrow gorge. The tall cliffs on either side show how far the river has cut down through the rock since the last ice age. These steep cliffs are out of reach of fire and grazing animals, and so have become the last refuge for some surprising plants. Now, I've worked myself into this almost impossible position to be beside one of the rarest plants in the gorge. No, not this one, but this. And dedicated a botanist as I am, I can't really work up much enthusiasm about it. But there it is in one form, that's its leafy form. And that, believe it or not, is it's not so leafy form and it scrambles about over the rocks here. And would you believe it, it's a member of the daisy family, Helichrysum dimorphum. It almost makes you die of laughing. <laughs> but it's no laughing matter for New Zealand's native vegetation has for the past thousand and especially for the past 150 years been under massive attack. Just look at it. Canterbury's famous outwash plains, formed by material eroded from the southern out by successive ice ages. When farmers arrived on the scene, most of it was covered with native forest. Now, it's the home of Canterbury land and other prime agricultural products. You see, modern farming has replaced natural diversity with monotonous uniformity. Where are all the plants and animals that used to live here, squeezed almost out of existence into odd corners and waste places? So teams of scientists are now surveying and cataloguing the genetic refugia in 268 districts, which have been chosen on the basis of their rock types and their ecology. Once located, each becomes a PNA, a protected natural area. This is just one of the conservation initiatives to ensure that nothing more is lost than the complex diversity of the life of Moa's art. A Kiwi scientist comes face to face with one of the many native hebes. They tread hallow ground because it's still dominated by native plants. And here, a fern new to science, it's never been discovered before. We can only guess what's been lost in the past. 
This eerie of survival must be added to the list. I reckon that the PNA project is a great idea. It's very important that none of the districts lose track of their real natural identity. I mean, take the Canterbury Plains, for example. I mean, this is wall-to-wall -wall fitted agriculture. But in amongst it are lots of natural bits. It's important to know what they are, where they are, and then look after them. So perhaps one day we can stitch the whole thing back together again. Christchurch at last, and almost at the end of my long pilgrimage, which has taken us from stem to stern of Moe's Ark. I may be last, but I've learned a lot since mixing my breath with the first people to come this way. And through the eyes of the Tuatara, I've discovered how the Ark was built and rebuilt on its voyage of over 80 million years. And although I'm not going to win this race, I know that as the story unfolds over the next three programmes, New Zealand has a lot to teach the world in the race for planetary survival.